Welcome to the Wednesday Bible Study on July the 5th of 2023. We're glad you're tuning in. It is our prayer that you enjoyed your National Independence Day yesterday on July the 4th. We do have a great, blessed existence here in this nation right now as we are able to move about with great freedom and the freedom that we have, especially in worshiping our Heavenly Father without fear. We pray that these freedoms may always continue. If you listen to our live stream on Sundays, often our men in this congregation will pray and offering God thanksgiving for those blessings and a prayer for continuance. We know it may not always be, and thus we also pray for courage in case these liberties are taken away. But as we celebrated that National Day of Independence, we also don't want to forget that we have a freedom in Christ. We have a freedom from sin. We have liberty in Him to be servants of God in giving God our faithful servitude. And I pray that each day you strive to be a faithful servant of God. And may these Wednesday Bible studies aid you in, in a better understanding of how to serve Him, how to please Him, and how to ultimately go home and be eternally in fellowship with our Heavenly Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, you might open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 13. I guess you could say we're beginning today as we enter the second half of the year 2023. We're kind of entering the second half or the second phase of the writing of Luke in the book of Acts. Last week we ended chapter 12, and of course we had explained that chapter 12 was kind of a transitionary tra chapter. The content would take our focus off now Peter and enter it upon Jesus, or upon uh, Paul in his work for Jesus. And so as chapter 13 opens up, we're going to begin a great focus on the Apostle Paul, and in particular, in his missionary endeavors. Paul is going to make over the next three chapters, he or over the next uh, chapters in the book of Acts, the uh, 13th through the 28th chapter, he is going to make three missionary journeys, and then he is going to be a prisoner in a trip to Rome. And so we're going to be focusing on the great work that the Apostle Paul did in the furtherance of the kingdom throughout the world, particularly the Gentile world. With Acts chapter 13, we do want to note that there are four distinct parts to it. And uh, the first part is a focus on the church in Antioch. Remember, uh, the Apostle Paul had gone there at the behest of Barnabas in Acts chapter 11, uh, Antioch in Syria, which was north, due north of Jerusalem and, and the area of Judea and Galilee. And then uh, later in this chapter, we're going to mention another Antioch, this one in Pisidia, which would have been in Asia Minor. But Paul assembled with that congregation a whole year, and in verse 1 through 3, we're going to give a little focus to that congregation, the progress they had made, and from whence Paul and Barnabas are going to be sent out in the missionary journey. So the first part, verse 1 through 3, will focus on the church of Antioch in uh, Syria. Then we'll focus in verse number 4 through verse number 12 regarding Paul and Barnabas, or Barnabas and Saul, as they preach through the island of Cyprus. Then, as Paul comes back to the mainland, you're going to see Paul and his company uh, reach Perga in verse number 13 as they uh, set foot in Asia Minor. And we just have one verse that mentions that time in Perga, and no doubt, because in, in the role or the, the, the plan that Luke has, it will be that point at which John Mark is going to retreat. He's going to go back to Jerusalem, leaving the company of Paul and Barnabas. And then the latter portion of the chapter, the fourth part, is Paul and his company in Antioch in Pisidia. And that will take us from verse 14 through verse number 52. So those four distinct parts of this chapter as they break down, and we'll, we'll begin to look at the first couple of these anyways in our study today. We do want to begin with this statement regarding Paul and the church at Antioch. In verse 1 through 3, let, let's read these verses together. He says, Now there were in, in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, 
that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. I think we, we do well to focus for just a moment on this church in Antioch and some implications that are here that need to be uh, understood and even application made to the present condition of the church. Remember, Paul had assembled with them for a whole year. Acts eleven twenty six. Paul and Barnabas had, uh, had arrived back in Antioch after Barnabas had gone to Tarsus to get Saul. For a year, they assembled there. The church grew. The church was solidified. And then there was the brief time that Paul and Barnabas go to Jerusalem to take relief that those in Antioch had, had gathered in, in view of the great dearth that was going to come as prophesied by the prophet Agabus. They take that relief. The events happen in Acts chapter 12 regarding Herod vexing the church and then the death of Herod. And Paul and Barnabas return to Antioch. So what is said here of the church incorporates the time that Paul was there in the full year he assembled before going up to Jerusalem and then in the time that he returns. Uh, a lot of commentators set the date of this first missionary journey sometime around 47 AD. And so it may be that a couple more years pass between verse number 25 and verse number 1 of chapter 13, verse 25 of chapter 12 and verse 1 of chapter 13, as far as a timeline. Uh, maybe that's the case, maybe it's not. It may have been much sooner, but at least we can say this was the accomplishment of the work that Paul engaged in. And what we see here regarding the church in Antioch is a very stable and a very strong congregation because there was in the church in Antioch certain prophets and teachers. Now, notice the term as, giving us an, an understanding that the names that are mentioned are, are just a sampling of those that were actually there. There were others by indication or by the implication of the verse, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Menaean, and Saul are all individuals that are pointed out by Luke. Could it be that they had a certain understanding uh, in the mind of, of Theophilus to whom Luke was writing, and that's why he singled them out? Perhaps. I, I don't know for sure or for certain why all these names, the five of these names are the ones that are singled out of the prophets and teachers that were in the church at Antioch. It, it makes sense why Barnabas and Saul are so mentioned, and then the other three that are mentioned not 100% sure why they would be mentioned by Luke, but they were. And they fall into this class of prophets and teachers, making a distinction between the two. A prophet, of course, was a teacher, but not all teachers were prophets. Not all teachers were inspired mouthpieces of God. Prophecy was indeed a, a spiritual gift. In fact, you note in, in Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible says in verse 11 that he gave some apostles, Saul was certainly an apostle, he gave some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. The term pastors there, we might need to understand, is the same uh, word or is a word that appears uh, or appeals to that group of leaders within the church that were also called elders or bishops. So the term pastor is often misappropriated today in reference to a preacher, as though there is a, a single pastor system. But in the New Testament, the term pastors is found in the plurality in a congregation, and it's the same group of individuals that are listed in, in the qualifications or attaining the qualifications and so appointed as elders or bishops that 1 Timothy chapter 3 uh, verse 1 beginning talks about, and then Titus chapter 1 at about verse number 5 beginning. So they were said in the church, and teachers, 
all for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And what he's talking about in that passage in Ephesians is the spiritual gifts that were employed that for some there were there were apostles like Peter and James and John, of course. There were 13 of them counting the apostle Paul, one born out of due season. And then there were others that were prophets like Agabus. Now of these in this verse of Acts chapter 13, I'm not certain uh, which was which. Some commentators will try to divide them as though the first three names, Barnabas, Simeon, and Lucius, were prophets, and then Manaean and, and Saul were mere teachers. Well, that wouldn't follow, because Saul, as we also know him as Paul, he was an apostle, and thus he would have been all of those things. He, he would have been a prophet, he would have been a teacher, he would have been a healer, he would have been a discerner of spirits. All of those uh, miraculous gifts that were given, Paul would have fit the bill. And so uh, we, we don't see a, a necessary division right there in, the, in dividing these names up, though some commentators do. Now, as it pertains to these prophets and teachers, uh, this was, as we read in, in Ephesians chapter 4, to the perfection of the church till we come to the full measure or the fullness of the institution. And, and of course, that has to deal with revelation. And once revelation were, was completed, then those particular offices of, of like prophet and, and apostle, and even in the sense of the miraculous endowment that that was given to the leadership of, of the pastors or the teachers in leading and teaching or leading uh, the congregation. Well, those miraculous gifts came to an end once the totality of the revelation was intact, which we have in Matthew through Revelation. So in the church at Antioch, we see a fully developed, a fully organized and stable congregation of God's people. And, and we see where Paul and Barnabas so labored, and within that time period of labor, even within a year's time, there is sufficient uh, time and there is sufficient growth for stability. And every congregation needs to be stable. Every congregation needs to be fully equipped and can be. Now, Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, that Timothy was to take the things that he had learned and commit them to faithful men, that they may be able to teach others. And no doubt, as Paul and Barnabas are going to be separated for a work in the mission field, they have well equipped this congregation of the Lord's people. Barnabas having been sent there by the apostles in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 11, and Saul being sought out by Barnabas to come, an apostle himself, they have helped to make this congregation able to stand without them present. And so Paul and Barnabas had done their job. And, and it begs the question of application, what about the congregation that you're a part of? What about here at Union Hill? What about whatever congregation that you, uh, wherever you are? We have some that watch from, from our local area. We have some that watch from other states, some that utilize this Bible study in, in other nations. And I've looked at the, the list of those who follow, like on Facebook and and like the videos each week. We have some in India that, that watch them, some in Africa that watch them, and throughout the United States. So what about the congregation that you're a part of? Are you helping to ensure its stability, its strength, and, and its endurable uh, endurance so that it may endure into uh, generations even beyond you? Saul and Barnabas did that with Antioch, helped to solidify, strengthen, 
and and set up that congregation in Antioch, and thus when they are called upon to go elsewhere, it is in capable hands for the future. Just like he told Timothy, commit those things unto others that they may be able to teach others also. And so so it is. And and it's it's needful to make that point and give consideration to the congregations that we're part of. Are we equipped and are we equipping others so that the next generation is going to be able to carry on the work of the Lord? Now, something about these names, let's just mention this uh, regarding Simeon and, and Lucius and Menaean. We don't know a mu- much at all about these individuals. In fact, uh, it may be that this is the only time that they are mentioned in the Bible. Um, it is the case that Simeon is a common name among the Jews. And thus, you might find others in the Bible, either by the name of Simon or Simeon. And thus, some will equate this man with others in the scriptures. And in particular, Simeon is referred to as the one who carried the cross of Jesus in Mark chapter 15 and verse 21, and the reason being the connection to Cyrene, and knowing that certain men of Cyrene had ventured to Antioch, and and that's how that congregation even began in Acts 11 and verse number 19 and 20, some suppose that this Simeon is that Simeon or Simon of Cyrene that would have carried the cross of Jesus. Now, that may be, it may not be. In, in fact, the probability, even though a lot of commentators give that um, uh, as though it's factual, it may not be, because Lucius is actually signified as one from Cyrene, but Simon is not. And and we also see here that Simeon was called Niger. And, and some people want to look at the definition of the Latin term here, Niger, to indicate something about Simeon. And that may be the case too. Maybe he was so called. Some would refer to it as a nickname. But yet, there's also the understanding that Simeon was a Jewish name or an Aramaic name, thus connecting him to the Jewish population but then Niger was a Latin or Roman designation, which would seem to indicate that, like the Apostle Paul, he, being a Jew, also had a Roman designation because of Roman citizenship. You know, in in verse number nine of our chapter, it says, then Saul, who is also called Paul. And some have made the, the statement that Paul's name was changed to Paul as though his conversion is what rendered the necessary change. But that's really not the case. Saul was a Jewish name. Paul was a Roman designation. Thus, he actually had both names. And up to this point, as we see Saul primarily working among the Jews and in Jewish uh, nations or places where there was a great number of Jews, like Jerusalem in Acts chapter 7, it would make sense that he would be referred to as Saul. Most of those Jewish individuals, even the Jewish brethren, would refer to him or know him as Saul. On the other hand, having a Roman designation, as far as the the powers that be in the Roman government, he would be known as Paul, Paul of Tarsus. And it makes sense here that that Luke would introduce he is also called Paul because he is being now, in this chapter, removed from that, that area of the world where Palestine was and just north of Palestine and Antioch, and he is going to be seen working among the Gentiles, working among uh, the Roman provinces, and thus the designation Paul. And it appears to be the case with Simeon here that he had a Jewish designation and a Roman designation in the same fashion as Paul uh, did too. And that may be all there is to that. Now, uh, anything else, we don't know about it.
We're not given that information from the scripture. As far as Lucius of Cyrene, it is true that Lucius is the name from which the term Luke is, is derived, or the shortened form of Lucius would be Luke. However, this is not Luke who wrote the book, not Luke the beloved physician who was uh, close in, in the work uh, uh, with the Apostle Paul, but this Lucius of Cyrene may be so designated here because of being one who, who was instrumental in the initial establishment of the congregation in Antioch. And then Manaean, which was brought up at, uh, with Herod the Tetrarch, uh, here we have one that that whole phrase had been brought up with is actually from one Greek word, suntrophos, which literally means foster brother. And, and it's the idea that, that this man Manaean had been a part of the the family of Herod. And so Herod, uh, this would be Herod Antipas. Remember a couple weeks ago we mentioned that there were at least five Herods uh, in the scripture. This Herod is Herod Antipas of Matthew 14 that had put John the Baptist to death. And, and it, would, it would follow that Manaean would have uh, converted because of the close connection that Herod uh, had for for John. John. Herod Antipas actually favored John, and it was out of guilt and, and uh, great remorse that he actually beheaded John the Baptist. And so Manaean being uh, a man who was a foster brother of that Herod, Herod Antipas, uh, he, he has obeyed the gospel. And that also demonstrates that the gospel has reach, reached up into the higher or upper class of, of citizenry. So we have those four or five names in the verse, including Barnabas and Saul, and three of them we don't know much about, but they were prophets, they were teachers in the church that was at Antioch. A couple other things about the congregation here that we might need to mention it does say in verse number two that they ministered to the Lord. And what would it mean to minister to the Lord? What, what are they doing in ministering to the Lord? Well, remember what Paul and Barnabas have been doing. They've been teaching the gospel. You go back to chapter 11 and you see that the work that they had been doing was in the, the teaching and preaching of God's word, both to the church as well as to uh, the the non-Christian or the non-believer. And so the by definition here, the ministering to the Lord describes the work they were doing in teaching and preaching. How does one minister to the Lord? Well, one aspect is that they would present the Lord's message. They would be teaching and preaching. And, and the term minister basically means servant. So what we have here is the fact that they were serving the Lord. How was Paul and Barnabas serving the Lord? Well, they were teaching and preaching the gospel. In Matthew chapter 25, in the context of verse 31 through 46, you'll notice that Jesus describes other ways in which men minister or serve him. And he talks about how the sheep on the right hand were rewarded because they had ministered in, in the ways of feeding the hungry or uh, giving water to the thirsty, or visiting the sick and in prison. And visit meaning looking in on and, and taking care of those needs. And so Jesus says, these are ways to minister. When you administer uh, help to, the, to those that are without or are lacking uh, in this world's goods, or you see after or you help those that are sick or even in prison, well, in so doing, you do it unto him, and thus you minister unto the Lord. So basically carrying out the work of the church, even when Paul and Barnabas carried that monetary support to those uh, Christians in Judea, delivered it unto the hands of the elders of the church there, uh, they were ministering unto the Lord. They were doing the work of the church, thus serving the Lord. So to, to teach and preach, to, to uh, provide for the, the welfare and well-being of others, uh, 
all of those things would involve ministering of the Lord. What what do you do? How do you minister unto the Lord? Are you ministering to the Lord, serving the Lord in those capacities? Certainly, if we're going to serve the Lord, we have to do it in ways that he authorized. He's only going to be rightfully served or rightly served in the ways that he is so designated. And thus, how are we serving the Lord? This congregation in Antioch was serving the Lord. And so, uh, so should we. Number two, not only did they minister to the Lord, they were fasting. And, and I think it takes, it's well worth our time to take a moment and, and speak about this matter of fasting because we do see it in the Lord's church. In fact, right here, it's mentioned twice. Uh, they were ministering to the Lord and fasting in verse number two speaks of their action up to this point. In verse number three, it talks about the action that they took after the Spirit said to separate Saul and Barnabas, or Barnabas and Saul, uh, for this task. And so it was it was a an activity, an action that they were engaged in, uh, even up to this point. So what does it teach us about fasting? Well, when we look at the scriptures, even incorporating the Old Testament, there's actually only one prescribed fast. There, there's only one occasion in which the Lord demands or commands fasting to take place as a service or as a means of, of ministering or serving him or even worship unto him. And that was on the Day of Atonement. In, in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 29, he talks about how on that 10th day of the seventh month, they were to afflict their souls. And fasting there uh, was not just in, in the form of eating, but it was a restriction of other um, fleshly appetites being uh, refrained from. But particularly, we think of fasting in, in the, the removal of food for a time from, from our activity. Well, if that be the case, then, then what we're asking here is, is fasting something commanded today? We see the early congregations doing it, especially this one in Antioch. But even under the Old Testament law, we only have one day that was actually commanded, and that was the Day of Atonement. Paul actually mentions it later in the book of Acts when he talks about the fast being passed in, in Acts 27, I believe it's verse number nine, and he's talking about their, their ship voyage to Rome and the weather conditions. And, and as you get into that part of the year, the weather conditions upon the sea, Mediterranean Sea could vastly decline, much like here in the South, when we get into that time period of August, September, and even the early part of October as the peak of hurricane season, in the Gulf of Mexico or in the Atlantic, um, we would know that there is potential for dangerous storms. Shipping, uh, traversing the sea could be hazardous. And that's what Paul was saying there. And, and the fast, the 10th day of the seventh month, uh, falling in their, their particular time period would have been over into August or September or September, October, thus the time of year getting on into fall and, and closer to winter. What else could we say about it? Beyond that, we know that there were self-imposed fasts or there were traditional fasts. We know as the New Testament opens up that there was the activity or the practice of fasting. Even Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness, and we know he was he was refraining from food because afterward he he hungered. Uh, we, we know that others had fasted as well. Later in the book of Acts, we'll learn that there were those who took an oath that they would not eat or drink until they had killed the apostle Paul. So that, that part of fasting was self-imposed or it pertained to the traditions of men. There is no New Testament passage that speaks by imperative uh, form or imperative nature. That is there is no such passage that commands uh, 
at best you would have an example, but there is no reason for the activity here to be construed as a command or as a uh, apostolic precedent that needs to be followed. In Acts 27, the Lord's Supper was kept upon the first day of the week, and, and obviously we have an apostolic precedent as to when to partake of the Lord's Supper, but remember, we have a direct command from the Lord to partake of it till he comes. And, and Paul, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, talked about how as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till he come. So we have a direct command to keep that memorial, to partake of that memorial. The question of how often comes with the apostolic precedent. Here's what they did. And so uh, upon the first day of the week, we partake of it every first day of the week, which would be 52 times a year the Lord's Supper is going to be observed because that's what the first century church did by apostolic precedent or example. But as far as fasting, we have no such command. Jesus, however, does in Matthew chapter 6 give some regulation to it. If you're going to fast, if you're going to utilize the, the, the act of devotion in fasting, then observe these uh, points or follow these guidelines. And remember, he was dealing with the fasting of the traditions of the elders, the, the way the Pharisees were doing it. And he says, moreover, this is in verse 16 of Matthew 6, moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that may that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. And what he's saying is their purpose in fasting was to make a show before men. Their motive was to, to cause men to see and celebrate them as being extraordinarily religious in their fasting. And so they would take measures to, to make it appear before men or to make men see that they were fasting. He, he also says, but when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, which is in secret. If you're going to fast, it is a matter between you and God alone. It's not a matter uh, that involves other individuals. It's about personal devotion. So Jesus levies those particular um, regulations about fasting. So if we're going to incorporate it, if we're going to do it as an act of devotion, there is a sense of humility and humbleness that can be developed, the humbleness or the humility, uh, humility of the soul as you demonstrate or as you experience and come to understand that dependence upon God and, and even focus on the blessings that, that he's given, though fasting as a command is not supported by Scripture, Though if you're going to do it, follow the regulations of Jesus. This first century congregation is, is still carrying on that activity uh, that, that the Jews had long been doing. But it wasn't something that was solely connected to uh, Jews or to Christians. Uh, it really was a matter of expediency. Now, the other thing that we need to look at in this particular section is the fact that in verse 3, after they had been told to separate Paul and Barnabas, they fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, then sent them away. So we, we have a couple um, a couple things to, to focus on here. One is that after they were told they fasted and prayed, they demonstrated the, the seriousness of the matter, the importance of the matter, and the need for the blessing of God. Thus, there was fasting, that uh, self-imposed activity of devoting themselves fully to God, and then praying, seeking the blessing of God in the matter. And then, of course, they laid their hands on them. And the question might be, well, what does this mean? What, what does it mean that they laid hands on them? Well, Obviously, it wasn't for the part, uh, for the purpose of imparting spiritual gifts. Remember, Paul was an apostle. 
He had the ability to lay hands on others and impart spiritual gifts, just like Peter and John did. That was a prerogative of the apostles and solely of the apostles. It was the means by which those spiritual gifts, those miraculous uh, endowments were imparted unto people. And thus the laying on of hands here by the congregation, because in, in verse 3, they had fasted and prayed is a, is a is a congregational aspect here. Those in Antioch of that congregation engaged in this activity, not just those that were mentioned in verse 5, uh, but the, the congregation as a whole. And they laid hands on them is, is not the idea of the, the physical or the spiritual gifts, rather, but rather a means by which they demonstrated uh, the fellowship or the desire for future success, even the idea of encouragement and fellowship. Uh, we might look at it in the terms of, of other passages like 2 John and 3 John. In 2 John, when writing to the, the uh, elect lady, he was talking about those that do not bring the doctrine of Christ. And he says, receive them not into your house, neither bid him God speed. The bidding of God speed there is the idea that there was fellowship, there was joint participation, and even the matter of helping along the way. So when one might would come to a first century home, a Christian home, as a missionary, they might be taken in and not only provided for while they were present in that place, but when they got ready to depart, that that group of people, particularly like this elect lady, would help them on their way, may even go part way in the journey with them, but then provide provision for them as they might need going forward. It same is said of, of Gaius in third John, when he says, Beloved thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. What Gaius was doing was bidding them Godspeed. When these teachers would come to, to his place of residence, to the city in which he resided, well, he would take care of them. He would, he would provide to them a, a charitable work taking care of them as they were present, but also uh, going along with them and providing that support for them, as he says, bringing forward on their journey, helping them to be able to advance their cause beyond uh, his uh, residence. And so that laying on of hands was a way in which they would bid God speed, a way in which that they would encourage or show fellowship for the activity we might, we might in part relate it to our goodbye handshake, as we might shake hands in departing one from, from another, there is the sense of bidding God speed, of encouraging or as um, des, uh, demonstrating desire for their success and, and for, their, uh, for their benefit and good as they go forward. And, and then sometimes even assistance as they would go. So that's what the laying on of hands means there. The other thing says they sent them away. Now, it's obvious that the Holy Spirit was responsible for this. The Spirit said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And so there is the concept that, that they... Uh, were being sent by the Holy Spirit. Now, exactly how the Holy Spirit relayed that, was it through Saul? Was it through Barnabas? Was it through one of the other prophets? Uh, was it audible? I don't know. I just know the Spirit was responsible for the message, and Saul and Barnabas were uh, immediately separated for the work, and then they were sent on. And and what what we see here is the sending on, just like the laying on of hands, is is all part and parcel of helping 
Paul and Barnabas as they begin their journey. And so they do. They go. They fulfill that work. So it, it's needful to look at that church in Antioch just briefly. And those three verses actually say a, an awful lot about that group, that congregation there. And, and it just causes us to look inwardly and, and note, number one, we need to be a part of a local congregation. All through the book of Acts, there is the, the teaching, there is the understanding that God wants the Christian to be an active part of a local congregation. You're not a Christian at large if you're right with God. You're not just one that drifts to and fro, sometimes here, sometimes there, never in one place and never actively participating with a, a single congregation, but rather God wants you a part of a local congregation. And then, of course, there is the mission works that those local congregations will support as Paul and Barnabas go forward and establish those congregations in places. And, and I would just have you remember that when all of this mission work was over, in Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas come back to Antioch, signaling that they are a part of that congregation. And we've talked about that already in our study of the book of Acts. Number two, as part of the local congregation, you need to be helping it grow. You need to be growing yourself. You need to be developing your knowledge of the truth and your ability to teach the truth, your ability to minister to the Lord, being useful unto God. When the Spirit says, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, it's because they were meat for the Master's use. They were usable by God for that work. And we also need to be suiting ourselves, making ourselves pliable to the Lord that he can use us in his work. So there's some great lessons from the church here at Antioch, even beyond the individual involvement, there is the support that this congregation is giving to the, to the preaching of the gospel elsewhere. So they're very supportive and encouraging of the, the gospel going forward in the world. All of that should be said of us too. Now, as we, we look to the further part of the chapter, the next part, as Paul and Barnabas are sent forth by the Holy Ghost, they depart unto Seleucia. Now, in, in the remaining part of the chapter, you're going to see that there are three provinces, Roman provinces, and five cities that are mentioned. So as, as far as provinces, you're going to see, number one here, they're going to depart to Cyprus. Cyprus was an island that was about 150 miles long in the, the eastern Mediterranean Sea, about 150 miles long by 60 miles wide. And, and it was its own province in the Roman Empire. In fact, later on in the chapter, we'll see a man by the name of Sergius Paulus. He was actually the Roman uh, designated uh, proconsul there. He was actually in charge of that island. And so... Um, Cyprus was a province to itself. You'll notice then when you get to chapter 13 and verse 13, they, they enter into Perga in Pamphylia. Pamphylia was another Roman province along the northern Mediterranean Sea on the, uh, the southern part of Asia Minor. And then you'll notice Pisidia is mentioned in verse number 14. And, and Pisidia is a little north of Pamphylia, but right on the edge of the region of Galatia. Uh, Galatia is a, a region, Pisidia is a smaller province, and so uh, what we're actually looking at here in chapter 13 and 14 are going to be those churches of Galatia that Paul will later write to in Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystra, in Derbe, and so we have those three provinces that are mentioned, larger sections of the uh, Roman Empire. We might would make it, uh, to, to our understanding, like states in the United States. And then you have the five cities that are mentioned. Seleucia is actually the seaport uh, 
uh, on the Mediterranean Sea for the city of Antioch in Syria. The, the Antioch where the congregation was from which, Simon, uh, which Paul and Barnabas were sent out, uh, Seleucia was the seaport city. From Seleucia, they set sail unto uh, uh, Salamis, which was a city on Cyprus, on the eastern end of the island of Cyprus. And they'll go across the island to Paphos, which was the westernmost city on the island of Cyprus, and also happened to be the capital city, the seat of the Roman government on the island of Cyprus. You'll notice that Perga is mentioned in Pamphylia, and, and Perga was actually um, inland from the Mediterranean Sea, uh, sea up a river uh, inlet just a, a few miles, but uh, that area was, was greatly infested with pirates or robbers, and, and you do recall that Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 said he was uh, faced with perils of robbers. Certainly that might be a place where where such a peril would be incurred. And then he goes to uh, from Perga to Antioch. And that's the Antioch in Pisidia, which is north of, of Perga in Pamphylia. So we have the five cities, Seleucia, Salamis, uh, Paphos, Perga, and Antioch. Six counting the Antioch in, in uh, Syria. But as far as the mission work, uh, we have five distinct cities and three provinces that, that Paul is going to work through uh, with Barnabas and others. We'll end the day with, with this note, because we don't have time to get into the events in Paphos and deal with Elam, Elamus and, and Sergius Paulus, but we will note that when Paul lands at Salamis, he preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And you'll notice a pattern here that everywhere Paul goes, he is going to seek out and go first to a synagogue of the Jews. Now, it might be of note that in Romans chapter 1 in verse number 16, he talks about the gospel being the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And, and you might say, well, here's a pattern where you preach to the Jew and then you preach to the Gentile. And that's the pattern because the gospel is for the Jews first and also to the Gentile. Um, not necessarily what is meant there. Because remember in Ephesians chapter 2, he talks about, I believe it's in verse number 14, that the middle wall of partition was broken down. Uh, thus, no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. And that's what Paul even says in Galatians chapter 3, that, that he hath, you know, in, in Ephesians 2, it made both one, the Jew and the Gentile, so making peace, uh, but also then in, in uh, uh, the, the book of Galatians chapter 3, he would say there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, male and female, bond or free, we're all one in Christ. So it's not necessarily just from the sense that well, the Jews need the gospel first, and then it'll go to the Gentiles. That had already been seen in first being preached to the Gentiles, or to the Jews, rather, in Acts chapter 2 through Acts chapter uh, 9. We see it primarily among the Jews. And then with Acts chapter 10, we see 10 years after uh, going to the Gentiles, and now time to go into the uttermost part of the earth. So why would Paul go then to the synagogue first? Well, Jesus, or rather the Jews, did have a, a, a scripture knowledge. They had the scripture, they had the knowledge of the scripture, and, and Jesus even said salvation is of the Jews, so it related to the religion of the Jews. And so in going to the synagogue, he would be talking to people who already had a knowledge of the Old Testament, who had already been prepared for the preaching of the gospel because of having had that, and it would serve as a base or a beginning point for the establishment of the church, a people already familiar uh, with God's plan through the Old Testament. And, and we might even add the Jews uh, had, or Jesus rather, was of the Davidic line, which pertained to the Jews, thus redemption uh, was wrought in Israel. 
And, and they would recognize that because Jesus had that connection to that Davidic line. It would also make sense that they had been looking for the Messiah. It would give Paul a beginning point, a platform from which to begin preaching the gospel in a place. And, and then with, with that being said, the Jews then could lead the Gentiles to the church. They would be able then to disperse among the city and reach Gentiles, bringing them to a knowledge of the gospel. So it kind of makes sense. It would be an organized way of, of presenting the gospel in, in, to, to the most people and have the most production. Because you would have people who had already knowledge of God's plan, once converted then, being able to reach and teach those Gentiles who had not yet knowledge. It, it would have been wrong to ignore the Jews based on what we've already said regarding their history and their past and their knowledge of Scripture, but going there with an organized means of preaching to many, because remember, the synagogue was going to meet every Sabbath day especially, and, and then maybe other days there would be those gathered. So because of the the structure of the synagogue, the way in which the scripture would be read and expounded, Paul knew as a Jew he would have a means by which to, to present the gospel, preach the gospel to the Jews. And then with success among the Jews, conversion of some of the Jews, he would have a, an ability then to reach the Gentiles uh, through them. And, and obviously, as you look to this chapter 2, in verse number 16, Paul stood up beckoning with a hand and said, Men of Israel, ye that, and ye that fear God, give audience. Um, those that fear God, as you look further into the text now to um, verse number 43, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath, meaning that among those that feared God would have incorporated or included certain Gentiles. And so by going to the synagogue, it would also prevent or present a means by which Paul may begin to reach the Gentiles too, because those that feared God being in close connection or close by uh, when the words of God or the scriptures were read and expounded, Paul would then have access to them, and they, as it was in Antioch later in this chapter, would appeal to Paul to hear more of the gospel, or to hear him again of that matter. So going to the synagogue made sense, and, and Paul made it a practice that if a city had a synagogue, that's where he began preaching the gospel for those various reasons, not just because of the the principle or the pattern to the Jew first and also to the Greek or to the Gentile, but these other reasons as well. But that that presents to us an understanding of, of preaching the gospel. And, and sometimes what we need to be focused on is looking to the green pastures. Where is there, kind of like Jesus talking about the pearl of great price, the, the man seeking goodly pearls went into the marketplace. He went to where he could expect to find those pearls. And then he found one of great price. In preaching and teaching the gospel, like Paul, we need to go where those pearls can be found, where those receptive souls can be found. And when we're among where those receptive souls can be found, we, we may just find one that is going to be receptive like the Gentiles were or like Sergius Paulus was uh, before that in, in Pathos. So we need to be looking for those opportunities, productive arenas in which the gospel can be preached. Now that doesn't mean that Paul didn't preach other places because he did. Paul preached in the marketplace. Any place where he could have an audience to hear, Paul was willing to preach. But he knew that there would be some fertile ground in those synagogues from which he could commence his preaching of the gospel in any city. And thus, 
We need to be looking for those souls to reach just as that pattern was presented by Paul in preaching the gospel, ministering to the Lord. We need to be like the church in Antioch, the individuals of that congregation working, ministering to the Lord. And so until next time, let us be looking for those opportunities where we can serve the Lord in the means and ways that he has authorized in his word.